moment we'll pick back up with verse 27. But uh, as you're turning there, William Henry Harrison was inaugurated as the ninth president of the United States on March the 4th, 1841. An alumnus of nearby Hampton Sydney College, William Henry Harrison was considered a war hero during the War of 1812, and this catapulted him to be a vital and viable, rather, candidate for the presidency. He was running against the incumbent, Martin Van Buren. Very early in uh, William Henry Harrison's campaign, his campaign strategist came up with a simple strategy. And you could summarize in two words, keep quiet. <laughs> and this passive strategy worked. They feared that he might say something wrong. And so throughout the campaign, he was not very visible. As a result of that, that strategy worked and he became uh, the ninth president of the United States. The problem was his inaugural address. This man who had been quiet for so long unleashed the longest inaugural address in history. He spoke for almost two hours without trench coat and hat in downpouring rain. And he indulged himself in how long he spoke to the detriment of those who were listening that cold day, but not only to their detriment, but he died less than six weeks after that from pneumonia that he contracted that particular day. We're looking today again in 1 Corinthians 11. We're looking at the subject of life in community. We've been talking and we've been looking at the scripture and trying to understand how are we in the church today to live in community. And, and very simply put, what we're going to see today is we're not to live in excess. We're not to indulge ourselves. It's not about us. It's not that we have our time to say and we can say what we want to say or to do what we want to do, but it's very clear the teaching here that when we live life in community, we're to live being thoughtful of others and we're to live for the glory of Christ. With that in mind, I want you to look with me at uh, our continuation of our text this morning. And so Paul writes, so then... Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. Let's pray. Fathers, we open your word today and as we go through it, uh, Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your church, that, Lord, we can live in community. Father, you're a God of fellowship. You're a God who promotes fellowship. As we've seen, you're a God of order. And so, Father, as we look at uh, this example from uh, the very early church there in Corinth. Help us to be able to apply its truth to us, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we've seen and will see, the church at Corinth had issues. In, in fact, maybe of all the churches to whom Paul wrote, the church at Corinth had more than any other. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God still loves a church with issues, that still loves people with issues because there's no perfect church and there are no perfect people. But as we look at this, the third of 10 messages in this subject, you know, as with the first two messages, Paul addresses a threatening issue in the church there. In fact, in verse 17, he says, now in giving this instruction to you, what he's getting ready to tell them, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, 
but for their worse. And so we see here the issue had to do with their public gatherings. When they as a church came together, it wasn't what was going on in their individual homes, not necessarily in their personal lives in this case, but he was able to make a judgment and we know to be an accurate judgment of what was happening when they were coming together. They were not acting very Christian. Now, I hesitate a lot of times to say acting Christian because some people think that Christianity is just a behavior or an outward comportment, but it's not that. Christianity is a vital relationship with the living Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I think in this context, it is accurate to say they were not acting very Christian because as they were preparing to partake of the Lord's Supper, in their context, they were acting in a way that totally contradicted everything the Christian life represented. And the specific issue had to do with this. It was the gatherings over food at the church meeting. Certain people were indulging themselves, engorging themselves, some of them even drinking to excess, while others in the same assembly were being deprived. We're going to look at more detail, but the fact of the matter is that through their church, church actions, through what was happening in these meals, it was not just inconsistent with what being a Christian meant, but it was happening in the context just prior to partaking of the Lord's Supper, which represented what? Not taking, but giving what Christ gave. And so you can see that Paul was very upset with what was happening here. You know, in this series of messages, we've seen and we will see diverse issues, but every single issue that we're going to consider in this 10-week study has to do with living in community. We need to have our head on a swivel. We need to be aware what it means to live in community, that that being a follower of Christ is not an isolated thing, that God's desires that we be in a community of believers, but not just that, it's important to Him, important for the well-being of the church, that we live rightly in community. And the goal of every church is to build up the individual members toward Christ's likeness, and as a result of that, to glorify Christ. And, and another thing we've been talking in this series of life in community, that we would so live in community, the love and the consideration, the love of Christ would so abide among us that we would be a light in our community, that, that we would be a light uh, in our community. In fact, you notice in your bulletin, we have an opportunity, the yellow sheet there, uh, to serve even this Saturday, our community. And there's some projects that we have. I want to draw your attention uh, to that. But today we're going to look first at the problem and then the paradox and finally the prescription that Paul gives to it. First we see the problem. There were divisions and disinterest in the church there. We see it in verses 17 through 22. You know, uh, we often talk of ourselves as Baptists of being people of food. We like to eat a lot. It's very interesting. These first three messages, two of the messages have to do with food. The first message in this series had to do with what to eat or what not to eat. But the issue here was not what or what not to eat. It was how they were eating in the public gatherings. And, And there was an issue to Paul. And and so in order for us to understand really what was going on here, we need to understand the context. You know, in just a few moments, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And in our context, in our culture, in the Baptist church, it is that we have small portions that we partake in small manner. And we have a small wafer, we have a small uh, uh, cup from which we drink. But in the early church, accompanying the observance with the Lord's Supper was also a large feast, and it would happen before the Lord's Supper, and it was called an agape feast or a love feast. And and so as you think about that, what was happening in the church, there would be the Lord's Supper, they would, in obedience to the Lord, observe it. But before that, they would have what we might call a, a potluck supper or a covered dish, and everyone would bring everything. And what a way to 
to dovetail into the observance of the Lord's Supper. Everyone would, would understand what it meant to live as one in the body. There would be sharing, there would be fellowship, there would be joy, and God would be pleased with it. But that wasn't happening in Corinth. The, the, the meal was happening, but how it was carried out was not in a godly way. Paul was upset because some were eating, in fact, engorging themselves while others were being neglected to no concern of those who were enjoying their own company and their own fellowship. In other words, we might say this small section of here uh, was doing uh, without, whereas the rest of them were just enjoying and looking at each other and enjoying the meal and neglecting those people. You know, when I was a child, my parents had a constant flow of people in our home. I, I lived in town, and, and I, cannot, I can hardly remember a day when we didn't have friends over. My parents would have friends over. Um, the church youth group would come over. College students would come over. And so it would not be unusual for us to set two or three other places uh, and one time, we invited a number of college-age guys. They were older. I was a child, and my dad had a lot of younger men that he was mentoring, and so mom fixed the food, and it was about eight of us around the table. There was one big guy named Johnny. He was about 6'5 and 300 and some pounds. He was so large that they actually buried him in a piano case when he passed away, but, but Johnny... When, when, the ta when the food came around the table, he took his fork and pierced like four hamburgers and set them out on his plate and unloaded them. That was fine. The only problem was there were about three or four more people to eat. And so he was engorging himself. He was eating and he was eating. And I can understand with Johnny because he was a young guy and he had a healthy appetite in that. Maybe he would have an excuse, but not the church at Corinth here. It was wrong that they weren't looking around the church or around the table and saying, I need to think about my brother. I need to make sure that he has something to eat. I need to make sure that my sister is covered. No, they were just eating and eating and eating while others were being neglected. The agape feast in Corinth was anything but a love feast. And Paul rebuked them. Look at what he says in, in verse 20 as he's upset with the church. He said, when you come together then, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who uh, have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this matter. We see a series of rhetorical questions and he's rebuking them. He says that there are divisions over the meals. He said each one eats his own supper. In other words, what was happening, you know, when I, when I brought the macaroni and cheese, I said, that's my macaroni and cheese and just my friends. It's not pooled to everyone. You're going to be left out. We're going to enjoy it. Each one was eating his own supper. And so Paul's saying, you can do that at home. Just fix your meal and eat your own. But when you come together, it's life and community. You, you, you don't exclude others while you indulge yourself. As I said, old Johnny could be forgiven, but, but the church here had a main problem. The rich were probably bringing more and they were neglecting the poor. At the same time, in the same place in which they were preparing to partake from the Lord's table, where the scripture says that we might become rich, Christ became poor. And so you can see uh, the inconsistency here that it was a misnomer to call it a love feast. Paul was upset. They weren't glorifying Christ. They were neglecting others. Well, how does this apply to us in a day when we don't have a large meal that precedes the partaking of the Lord's Supper? Well, to me, the application is this. The church does not exist for you and for me primarily. It's not about us. We're living in a day-to-day -day with a consumerism mentality. The thought is, well, I don't like the preaching or I don't like uh, the temperature here. I don't like this. And before long, you hear, I, I, I. There's no thought of community. It becomes entitlement. It becomes 
filling up oneself with one's own need. When God calls an individual into fellowship of the local church, it is others in the Lord Jesus Christ, building up others, serving and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a place where we should serve. And by the way, and contextually here, as we apply it to our situation today, we should be a welcoming church to all people. We shouldn't be the type of people that after the service just meet our own needs and meet with our own friends. We ought to be instruments God would use to meet someone new, to reach out, to reach the newcomers who are here, those who are hurting that maybe are not saying it out loud, the elderly, the young, those brash Corinthians in our text today, they were so busy stuffing their faces, they weren't thinking about others, and they were missing that corporate, corporate blessing of being involved in the local church. That's the problem, but look, let's see the paradox, and we've already looked at it. The paradox was this. It was happening before the Lord's Supper, right before the Lord's Supper, that represents God giving and emptying himself for our well-being. They were serving themselves to the neglect of others. It's a paradox. You know, paradoxes, they're abundant. I've shared a few in the past. Why is it we drive on a parkway and park on a driveway? Why, why is it that on Labor Day most people don't work? Maybe we ought to call it no Labor Day. There, there are lots of paradoxes, but let me bring it home to you that I think would apply in our situation in something that may happen in your life. I'll confess it's happened in my life. Maybe you're at home, things get heated, you're arguing with a child or a spouse, and you're saying, you never do this, or you always do that, and, and things escalate verbally, and then the phone rings, and somebody says, hey, Rick, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. You've been there, I've been there. You see the inconsistency? What, what does your wife, what does your husband, your children think when you're doing fine? Saying, that, that doesn't, that's not right. So here, these people that were to, to be involved in a fellowship meal right before the Lord's Supper, they were engorging themselves, indulging themselves to the neglect of other people, and now they're going to sit down at the Lord's table and say, we appreciate your sacrifice for us. Paul's saying, it's not consistent, it's not right, and it upset him. They had no reverence for the Lord's table. And so what does Paul do? He brings them back to the institution of the Lord's Supper itself. We see in verse 23 and following, he said, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And notice what it says, two things. He broke the bread, gave thanks for it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul was bringing them back to that original institution of the Lord's Supper, the Lord said, this is my body given. I'm, I'm not taking, I'm giving for you. His blood was shed on behalf of others. And so how could it be that these followers of Jesus Christ, right before they commemorate that which represents what Jesus gave for us, take from others and neglect the others? They were betraying the observance. Well, notice what he says in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Making the connection, they weren't practicing what they were preaching. Some of you, you'll never preach or teach a lesson, but when we partake of the Lord's table, through the action of doing so, we're proclaiming the Lord. So what he's saying, you're proclaiming God's sacrifice, yet you're living in a way that's totally inconsistent. They weren't practicing what they were preaching. And so we see that paradox there. And, and how we need God's Spirit, and we've been studying about God's Spirit, to bring out such situations in our life, maybe when we're not acting consistently with what we profess. And that's what was happening here. Well, what's the prescription we see in verses 27 through 34? 
Simply put, search yourself in your heart. Notice what he says in verse 27. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Unworthy can speak to a number of things. Whoever takes unworthy. In this particular context, I think we can draw the line pretty simply. Their way of handling unworthy was they did not revere the Lord's table because their actions were selfish. They were not thinking of others, and in doing so, their observance was unworthy. As I said, there could be many other situations throughout history where this would apply in a different way. The fact of the matter is we're to approach the Lord's table not in an unworthy manner. Now, none of us is worthy. Notice it's not speaking of our being as, as being worthy. That's Christ who's worthy. But it's speaking of the manner in which we take it. The unworthiness speaks to the action, not the person. So what does he say? Verse 28, let a person examine himself. Let him examine himself. God, am I participating selflessly in your church? Or am I participating in the church to bring glory to myself or to get my way? God, am I reconciled to my brother and sister in Christ? Am I acting consistent, receiving your forgiveness? Am I willing to extend that forgiveness to someone else? Am I living consistently with what this table represents? God, I want you to be glorified in my life, in the church, right here at Concord, where to examine. Well, Paul follows what happens if one doesn't properly examine. He said, if you cannot monitor yourselves, God may discipline you. In fact, he brings out the point that that's why many, verse 30, in the congregation there were sick and were ill. Not that every illness can be directly tied to something someone's done wrong. Jesus elsewhere made that clear when the person asked who, who committed the sin, this woman or this man's mother or father, and Jesus said, no, that God would be glorified. So we don't often draw that and say, because someone's sick, there must be something wrong in his or her life. But in this context, how they were living was affecting not just their spiritual well-being, but their physical well-being. Why? Because they were eating without recognizing the body. That's what he says in verse 29. And what does that mean? That means just treating the Lord's table trivially, not thinking about what Christ has done for us. But it also could mean not recognizing the body of Christ for which Christ died, the church. So it could be Jesus' physical body that was broken for us, treating that irreverently by how we act, or not recognizing this beautiful thing that Jesus called the church. So Paul's saying, if you want it about you, go home. Eat all you want. But in God's church, it's about serving others, glorifying God. You know, in the late 1800s, Charles Sheldon wrote a book in his steps, and it's the book from which the popular saying from about 20 or 30 years ago, WWJD, came, what would Jesus do? As I was reading that this week, I thought, it's not WWJD here in, um, in 1 Corinthians 11, but it's WDJD. What did Jesus do? We don't have to ask here, what would Jesus do? We need to look back, what did Jesus do? And how it's a model for us as life and community. And real quickly, four things he gave. That's what it said. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood that's a new covenant giving for you. Jesus gave is our model. But not only did he give, he gave sacrificially. He gave not of his excess, he gave of his very being. He gave sacrificially. Thirdly, he gave purposefully. It wasn't a mindless giving. We know that he struggled even the night before he died. He said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He gave purposefully. He knew that he was giving his life. And finally, he gave effectively. He accomplished 
our salvation. You see, it's not just enough to look at Jesus as our example, but He is our lifeblood. Not one of us will ever, as it was said in our Sunday school lesson today, I think Bob brought it out, no one will ever see the kingdom of God, not even come close to the kingdom of God, apart from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice in these elements in what we have seen in our text today in regard to Jesus, it is give, 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 not indulge and not take. Dr. David Jeremiah, I read a quote this morning. I want to close with it as we look at partaking from the Lord's table. He said, so how will you spend the life that was given to you at such a great sacrifice. Let me repeat that. How will you live your life that was given to you at such great sacrifice? Let me give you a hint. It's not the way this certain group was carrying it out in 1 Corinthians 11. It's not indulging. It's not about you or about me. It's following the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, as we prepare our hearts to partake from this table, we thank you for your word, which reproves, which corrects, which gives us understanding. Father, that trains us in righteousness. Father, it's our desire that as we come to this table that our lives would be consistent with what this table represents as we are followers of you. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's in his name I pray, amen. Just a moment, we're going to have our hymn of invitation. What an appropriate...